How's everyone doing today? Good stuff. I think that I've got a better turnout because the rain is just completely bucketing down out there. I'm sure most of you would rather be out laying next to the pool reading a book and having a drink. So instead you come in and you listen to me and have a drink. Well, the good news or the bad news is it looks like it's the same weather for tomorrow. So hey, you can always come back and join me tomorrow because I'll be back again. So just a bit of a polling in the room. How many people have been at at least one or two of my previous sessions? All right, this is awesome. Thanks for coming back. And have, whose first time is it? Yeah, the board okay. Oh, wouldn't, no, no reason to apologize for any of that. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Logan. You've probably seen me around most often sitting in the Encounter Hotel, you know, uh, working on presentations, drinking beer, singing along, all those sort of things, and doing none of those correctly. Uh, I've been in IT for a little over 30 years, almost all of that security related. Well, probably getting closer to 35 years now. Uh, I basically am an independent security consultant which means I work for a whole bunch of people and I work for myself, which means I don't work much. Uh, and of course, I become a security presenter on cruise ships. And the reason I started cybersecurity uncensored was I feel that most of us are overlooked by big businesses when something goes wrong. The Medibanks, the Optuses, whenever they get breached, they don't care about us. You know, They'll give the, the, the token statement, uh, we apologize for the inconvenience. Well, that can be anything from your train running two minutes late to a catastrophic outage of the entire Optus network, which is a complete other presentation of mine. Uh, but what I like to do is be able to get in front of people and give them information to try to help, help you stay safe. Most of it costs you absolutely nothing. And one of my key points is time. You can undo most scams just by taking your time to understand what they are, to verify what they are. Whereas we're conditioned basically from the time we're children to react, react, react. And if you've heard the term social engineering, I prefer to use the term emotional engineering because they try to manipulate us into reacting. They try to use an emotional reaction in order to get us to do what they want. So, does anybody remember a time when you used to get on a cruise ship and there was just none of this internet stuff, you know? You, you just disconnected from land for however long it was. Even when you were in port, you didn't care. You know, if you carried a phone with you, it went into the safe and it stayed there until you got off the ship. And that was just the way it was. And then eventually internet was available on the ships. Uh, I remember quite a few years ago being on the Pacific Dawn. I'm sure some of you have been on the Pacific Dawn before. Uh, we had a suite, and as part of that package, we had 250 megabytes of internet access for seven days. So it's like, turn it on, quickly check Facebook, oh, no, turn it off. And you're, and you're constantly checking to see if you've got any data left. Now it's like just open slider, you know, you can stream YouTube. I streamed my session on Monday live, and I had people around the world watching it live. And it worked, you know, uh, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Now, I haven't tried that since, uh, mainly because I know today everybody's going to be online because we're not really outside doing a lot of other things. So I'm still recording it, and I'm still going to make it available on YouTube. And for anybody that came to my previous sessions, those sessions are now available on YouTube. And the reason I started doing that is because people say, we like your content, and even though you can give us a content by a copy of the slide deck, we missed the audio commentary that goes along with it. So I started recording these and making them available for anybody that wants to see them. So when you're traveling, how many people do a lot of research about where they're going and figuring it all out? Yeah, it's, it's natural. You want to figure out where you're going, what's the country all about. Now, in and amongst all that research, how much of it do you look at cybercrime in these destinations? It's a, it's a real and present danger. I mean, yes, you still have to watch out for the omnipresent dangers, like your pickpockets and your other types of scams. How many people have gone to Smart Traveler? Yeah, Smart Traveler, I think it's a great website. I mean, uh, I worked with Defense in Canada for a long time. A lot of the intelligence we get from various points around the world about you know, what hotspots to avoid, where you need to be cautioned, and then it's passed on you know, to people who are traveling abroad. Smart Traveler does that. And I have noticed increasingly that in a lot of sites, they actually include stuff about cybercrime. Uh, and if anybody looked at the one for Singapore, yeah, the overall crime rating is very, very low, but there is actually a mention in there about cybersecurity. Be wary of scams, strange phone calls, all these sort of things. So I like seeing this in travel bulletins. I think it's very, very helpful for us whenever we travel. And safe cyber does st start before you leave home. See, most people really only kind of think once they're actually in motion about what they need to do to stay secure while they're traveling. Well, you need to start doing this beforehand. Um, 
I'm going to go through a bit of this as we go, but one of the main things is limit who you share your trip details with. We love putting stuff online, but I'm going on this awesome cruise, 49 days to go. Some people I've seen book cruises way out at the back end of 2025 that say, you know, I've only got 650 days to go. But people know that you're going to be away. Now, if you live in a high occupancy building like myself, an apartment building, it's not really a big deal. What if you live in a house and your advertising factor going to be away? That's probably not a good thing. You don't necessarily want everybody to know that your home is going to be unoccupied while you're away. It's probably better to do all of this advertising after you actually get back. And then people say, oh, you're gone, I didn't know. Yeah, fine. Uh, be safe at the terminals. We're going to touch stuff like rental cars, hotel, Wi-Fi, charging ports, all the things that kind of go along with technology while you're in motion. Uh, what do you deal with border security and authorities? There's some little snippets throughout. I can do an entire presentation on what it's like to try to navigate uh, some different countries of the world with technology. Some are a little more challenging than others. And then, of course, what do you do when you get back? Because sometimes when you get back, what's the first thing you do? Laundry. Right? Turn the suitcase upside down on the laundry floor and then leave it there for a week. Or is that just me? Thank you. All right. So this is actually a page directly off the Smart Traveler website. They actually have a dedicated section on cybersecurity. And if you go to this site, there's actually a lot of detail in there. There is a lot of detail in there to be had. Uh, this didn't exist until fairly recently. I mean, it's been updated as of uh, July of last year. Um, but there was a time when they didn't have it. I mean, look right in there. You've got armed conflict, assault, cybersecurity, demonstrations, earthquakes, tsunamis. I don't know if cybersecurity necessarily belongs in that grouping, but alphabetically, sure. But before you travel in the future, I would recommend just going here, having a bit of a look through the list. Uh, a lot of the content that's in there doesn't necessarily change, but I think it's always served as a good reminder. And that's why we do security awareness training fairly regularly, because you get busy doing other things. Life carries on, cybersecurity threats are omnipresent. They're just not going away anytime soon. So before you leave or return, so some of the stuff applies in both places. Simplify, don't bring everything. How many people here think they overpacked for the cruise? Yeah, I've been cruising a long time and I still overpack. <laughs> and there's probably stuff hanging up in the closet that you're not going to wear. But have you brought technology that you're not going to use? I brought my iPad, I haven't touched it. I didn't even use it while I was on the plane. I fell asleep. But the fact is, try to cut down on what you're bringing with you. Yeah, sure, bring your phone and the chargers, but you don't have to bring everything else just because. Even now that I do these presentations, I basically travel with a GoPro. That's it. I, don't, I had my tripod here the other day, and I probably didn't even need that. Make sure that you've got a pin and a password on everything. You still can use some devices without pins and passwords on them. Uh, you know, if you're really only using it in a limited context, some people just don't want to be bothered with pin every friggin' time they pick up the phone. But before you go anywhere, make sure you have a pin or a password enabled on it. Enable roaming. Yes, that can cost a bit of money. I realize that. And I would probably be more likely to enable roaming or get an eSIM over using sketchy Wi-Fi. For the simple reasons, cellular communication tends to be a lot more secure than Wi-Fi. It's basically between you to the tower, telco controls it, and so on. Is every cellular network in the world secure? No, but more of them are secure than Wi-Fi. I would definitely not be going into Macca's and sitting down and doing my online banking because you can go in there and say Mac has free Wi-Fi, but you don't know if it's actually Mac has to control it, or you've got some Muppet sitting in the corner on a Raspberry Pi with the same SSID, and hopes you connect to his instead. Yes, they can detect that sort of stuff. I see a hand raised, but I'm going to do Q&A at the end, and if you can hold it, but... Okay, no worries. Um, so, it's interesting, with an eSIM, at least you can set your phone up to hotspot. It's a bit more of a secure connection to the rest of the world. Back of your data and your device. So if something happens that you've got a whole bunch of pictures on your phone and you lose your phone, that could all be gone. Please back your stuff up before you go, including the configuration of it, because you don't want to start over from scratch. Remove unnecessary apps. Now the reason I say that is certain parts of the world where there's certain sensitivities and some content that's completely fine in Australia might not be acceptable overseas. Some apps are blocked in certain places. So all of a sudden, if you're using one of your favorite apps that's been banned in particular countries, and you connect to the network, and the detector using that app, you can land in a heap of trouble. 
Um, what those apps are, I can't tell them off the top of my head because that rule seems to change quite frequently. A sanitize your personal media. There's another one that I've seen people get pinged at. Now, I have friends that work in border security. Uh, a lot of people I know work for Canadian Border Services Agency, and whenever they do random inspections of people's devices, which they're allowed to do, they have just cause to do so, they said the amount of entertainment that they find on these devices is actually quite astonishing. And again, going back to my previous point about certain sensitivities in certain parts of the world, you might not necessarily want to have that stuff on your phone. So sanitize it. Uh, you can back it up and save it on an external hard drive at your house if it's that meaningful to you or just get rid of it all together. And have a plan B in case you lose your devices. You know, be able to get access to, uh, you know, if, if you rely on your phone and everything for paper copy, or except for paper copies of boarding passes, have a paper copy of boarding pass. Uh, be able to contact somebody else and have them contact you. So if you dropped your phone over the side of the boat, then all of a sudden nobody can get in touch with you. Well, it would have been a good situation if you'd given them the contact details for the ship, because in an emergency, they can contact the ship and the ship will come and find you. I have seen that happen in the past where they basically scoured the ships looking for an individual, but mind you, this is back in the days of like the Pacific Dawn, which is considerably smaller, and they probably just said, they're at the bar. That's where they find me. Uh, and that's exactly about pro providing the additional contact details to others. Make sure you can still reach out, but they can reach out to you. Uh, we're kind of in a world now where we're connected 24-7 and we're living in that just-in-case scenario. You've got your phone in your pocket all the time, just in case. Where it wasn't all that long ago where you would just leave the phone at home, if you even had a mobile phone, and just disappear. And then you get home, you lift the phone up, listen to the phone, voice messages if anybody left them, if anybody remembers answering machines and all that stuff. Yeah. So, okay, you've done all your research and now you're in motion. So you're at the terminal. Most often it's going to be the airport, right? And you realize that you've been mucking around on your phone and battery's running low. And now you start looking for a place to plug it in, what do you do? The other thing that people tend to go looking for is connectivity. Need to get connected to free Wi-Fi, I don't want to use all my data. For the most part, mobile data is fairly well available just about everywhere these days. But that bottom picture, you see these in various airports. Maybe it's not quite set up like this, but you'll look and there'll be like the table where you can sit down and have a meal and there's like a couple of PowerPoints and there's some USB points. Do you trust them? Well, I'd, uh, I'd be concerned about them. It's not to say that they're compromised, but they could be. Because the ability to basically put stuff behind that that intercepts traffic, yes, it's, it's a lot more difficult than it used to be. Uh, but I still wouldn't randomly plug my phone into any port because you don't know what's behind it in terms of technology. Just carry a spare one of these in your pocket. You know, you get them with your phones these days, or maybe they don't even with Apples anymore. Maybe they're just assuming that you've still got the device. Uh, but carry one of these things with you, at least that, if you, as long as you can find a PowerPoint, you can get a power. And public Wi-Fi is much the same thing. Uh, I sat in an airport once quite a few years ago and I had a wireless scanner, and I decided to fire it up and just see how many networks were out there. So I found four or five of the networks I'd expect. You know, the free one for the airport itself, the one for staff, the one for a couple of other purposes, and then probably about 150 other networks that I had no idea. Yes, there was the obvious ones like Mike's iPhone and stuff like that. But then there was other ones that like free Wi-Fi, free underscore Wi-Fi, all these other sort of things. I'm thinking, that's somebody that's fishing. That's somebody who's hoping somebody's going to connect to their network. And once you're connected to someone's network, then they can intercept your traffic. Yes, it's not always that easy, especially with encrypted traffic, but I'm not going to give anybody any opportunity to in intercept anything that I'm sending. You know, keep an eye on your technology. Uh, it's pretty easy for stuff to get swiped. You, you get up and just go, well, you know, I've gone through security. Uh, everything will be okay, I just leave my bag here. I see people in airport lounges, which is probably one of the worst offenders. And the people in the Qantas lounge, they just go in, they set up the laptop, they fire it all up, open their emails, and then they slot off to get a coffee or wine or something like that, and just leave their laptop sitting there unattended. And it's amazing how many people in places like LinkedIn and say, well, he's lucky that I didn't go over there and send him everybody pizza party Friday type message. And I'm thinking, well, if you're a true security professional, you'd be keeping an eye on that thing for him and then asking him about it afterwards rather than being tempted to do something. Then I question whether or not you have his white or black. So 
The main thing to remember here is because you went through security, doesn't mean you're secure. No. Yeah, sure, you've gone through all the metal detectors. They're just interested in trying to keep the planes safe, and try to keep them in the air, and to keep people from doing stuff. They don't really care if you're sitting there looking at Facebook and then all of a sudden somebody you know, sees your Facebook post and that sort of thing. Uh, and who is watching, directly and indirectly? Yeah, it's pretty easy to look around and say, well, this person can't, can't see my screen. Are you sitting behind any mirrors or anything like that? I was sitting in an airport um, overseas a couple of years ago, and there was this uh, gentleman sitting there working away on some rather interesting information, and there was another gentleman sitting next to him, kind of staring up like this. And then I realized that this guy was staring at a reflection of this other guy's screen. So, situational awareness. Can't have enough of it. Okay, so let's just say you've gone through this rigmarole, you've finally gotten to where you were. Did anybody fly out of Brisbane last Thursday and have to deal with umpteen delays? Yeah, no, I was on that flight too. Um, so let's assume you've got to where you wanted to be. See, again, you've got to watch and secure your devices at all times. Um, yes, I know Singapore is a very secure country. Uh, it, it's quite good. It's probably low on my risk index, but I travel to a lot of other places that aren't quite the same way. So you're always watching your devices. And here's one of my favorites. Never hand an unlocked device to anyone for pics. And people say, well, what are you talking about? Okay, so you're out, you're traveling with a group, and you've gone to this particular landmark, and everybody wants to get together to get the group photo. Gotta have the group photo, right? Love group photos. But you can't figure out who's gonna take the picture. Do you prop it up somewhere and then set a timer on it and run back? Do you try to get a selfie stick? Uh, you know, trying to coordinate that. But then some helpful, helpful sort comes along and says, I'll take your group picture. Could be legit, but it might not be. So when people hand them their phone, what do they do? It's unlocked. There is the ability with the phones to be able to activate the camera without having to unlock your phone. But a lot of people will still be there, they've got the phone open, and they just hand this unlocked phone to a random stranger. Right? And I see it happen quite frequently. Uh, Depending on what the people are like, sometimes they will approach them and just offer up a little bit of helpful advice. A little cautious, because sometimes people get quite embarrassed about that sort of thing, how uh, they react differently. But I would rather someone take a snipe at me than have someone else take off with their phone. You know, I've got big shoulders, so I can take it. And when I say avoid showing off your tech, this is when you're traveling to places like small island countries, Papua New Guinea, that sort of stuff. And I'll give you an example. I was on a cruise a number of years ago, and we went to Komodo Island. And uh, anyways, great, great day, waiting on the dock to get back down. So there's five or six kids all gathered around, and they're selling their little seashell necklaces and all these other sort of things. And the guy that was standing in front of me, he wanted to buy one. But he had like the, the kind of the saddlebag type thing, and it was hanging open. Kids weren't looking at him. They were looking at that bag and what was in it. And you could see plain as day, his wallet was in there, his iPad was in there, a whole bunch of other stuff was in there, right? Um, the other thing too is if you, let's just say you're riding a bus somewhere, and the windows are open, you know, because it's hot and that sort of thing, because a lot of these places don't have air conditioning. Uh, there's not somebody, if they just stop at light, is somebody just jumping, reaching into the window and grabbing that device out of your hand. Now, how many people here are iPhone users? How many people also have an Apple Watch? Interestingly enough, you can actually set up a macro on this phone, that it, or, or on this watch, that if someone were to steal your iPhone out of your hands while it's open, you can actually hit a button and it'll actually remotely lock it. I think that feature should be built in by default. Um, I may actually do a little tutorial video and throw it up on my YouTube channel just for anyone that's interested on how to set this up. Uh, then you have to remember to do it because if somebody grabs the phone out of your hand, you know, Thinking about going to your watch store, lock your phone might not be exactly front of mind. Back up your stuff as you go. Again, if you drop your phone over the side of the boat, has anybody ever done that? Has anybody seen somebody do it? It happens. There's all kinds of stuff goes over the sides of these ships. You know, beer bottles, cups, glasses, hopes and dreams, the odd phone. <laughs> Here's something that I never really thought about until recently when I started traveling a lot is, uh, a clean device can be suspicious. Sometimes it's not what's there, but what's not there. I had a friend that had an idea that, well, I'm just gonna wipe my phone, go through security, and then once I get to the other side, I'll just restore it. Sounds good in principle. 
until he got pulled up for random inspection and they wanted to know, how come your phone's blank? You know, what, what was on there? As it turned out, there was nothing objectionable. He thought he was just being smart while well, I didn't want him to go for my pictures. No, so the other six hours of interrogation was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Burner devices. Now, that page I showed you earlier, it does actually talk a bit more about burner devices. Has anybody ever traveled with a burner device? Probably not as popular these days because we all like our smart devices. We like our iPhones, we like our Androids, and they're expensive. They're way too expensive to use as burner phones. But we're talking about, you know, the old school dumb phones. If all you need is a phone to stay in communication with somebody, just go get one of those cheap phones. It gives you voice communication, maybe some basic internet connectivity, very basic screen. Um, in terms of texting, yeah, if you need to get into some of those letters, you got to really want it because you really got to go for it to try to spell the things. And I don't even know how we managed texting back in those days. But is there merit in a burner device? Yes, there is. Uh, particularly if you work for a business or a corporation uh, that might travel to some rather sketchy places around the world um, and that you have oversight by particular regimes uh, that may have a keen interest in what it is that your company sells. So a burner device may be practical in that case. But for the rest of us, poor plebs that work for these companies, no, not really. And sketchy Wi-Fi is everywhere, so use a VPN. Now, I actually do have a slide here about VPNs, so you've probably seen the slide I had about password managers. I've got one about VPNs. Uh, I won't discuss them in depth, but what I will do is I will throw it up long enough that if you want to take a picture of it, go ahead, and then you can do a little bit of your own research in the meantime. So these are a variety of virtual private networks. Now, how many people know how a VPN works? So if you could imagine your connection to whatever network is a pipe, let's just say it's four inch pipe, right? And everything goes back and forth through that pipe. But let's just say we don't know who else can see or put things into that pipe, right? So that pipe is our connection, but we don't know who owns the pipe. We don't know where the pipe goes. We don't know how many stops it has along the way. We don't know if other people are using that same pipe. What a VPN does is it gives you your own little private pipe inside of that. Like, for example, if you had a four-inch pipe, it'd be like your own two-inch pipe inside of it. And that is only yours. Only you communicate via that pipe. So a virtual private network is just basically a pipe within a pipe. And that's just a safe way to use public Wi-Fi. You can get the apps for your laptops. You can get the apps for your phones. Uh, NordVPN happens to be the one that I'm using. It's a bit more moving parts. It's a bit more complex because I've been using VPNs for a long time, so I'm comfortable. But there are some good ones on here, like Tunnel Bear for first-time users, Frequent Traveler, Cyber Ghost. These are some good stuff. But if you're going to travel and you have to use public Wi-Fi, even if you're just traveling around the city and you like to go to the cafe and do something, the VPN is worth it. Something else while you're away. Remember to secure your physical documents, too. Now, I know that I bang on about electronic data, which is probably the easiest thing to steal. But don't forget about your physical documents, your passports. If you printed out copies of identity documents, like a photocopy of your driver's license and all these other sort of things, make sure you secure them. Because it still contains the same information, just in a physical form. Driver's license number in hard copy, driver's license number in digital copy. It's still your driver's license number. So safes are not always safe. Um, because if you've ever gone someplace and you've forgotten something in a safe, which, which has happened, has anybody done that? It happens. You know, you're away, you're having a good time, you kind of forget to clean out the safe. Uh, in some cases, it's when you get to the airport and you realize you don't have your passport, and that ship has already sailed at the end. Yes, I have heard of these happening. Um, for the most part, I don't generally worry in a lot of parts of the world, uh, but there are some parts of the world where I really do question these hotel safes. Um, there is usually a sequence to get into them. If you look on YouTube under how to get into these safes, there are videos everywhere on how to do it. Don't do it, okay? Don't be tempted to go into your mate's room and say, oh, I'm going to see what he's going to say. <laughs> oh, no, I wish I didn't see that. Watch out for the distraction-based stuff. Now, this is what I was alluding to earlier when I was telling you about the story on Motor Island a few years back. Uh, a lot of times these thieves will work in pairs. You know, one will stop you to ask you for the time. Someone else will stop to ask you for directions or something like that. And while you're distracted, they'll either try to pinch what you've got or they'll try to do something else, uh, put a tracker in your bag, like, a, like an air tag or something like that. There's a variety of different things. So I usually say travel in pairs or groups and keep your wits about you at all times. 
A lot of places in the world you don't have to worry about that, but there's just as many and a lot more that you do. Uh, watch for the scams because nothing is free. You'll go to all these places. You know, if you sign up for this frequent flyer thing or you sign up as this rewards program or something like that, you can get all these free things. Nothing's free, folks. The price is your data quite often. And this is something I said in a couple of my other sessions, but when you go to sign up for something, use your email. And then what do you use? A password. And where's that password? It's the same password you use for absolutely everything else. So just be very cagey about these sort of things. And just keep an eye out for anything sus. I'm not going to go through the list because there's a lot of sus things around. I'm probably one of them. Okay, so here's some sketchy things that you do encounter. Uh, ATM skimmers. These are things that you always have to be able to look out for. It's getting a lot harder to duplicate cards. Um, like chip technology and that sort of thing is really, really hard to duplicate, getting to the point where it's really not practically useful anymore. But magnetic stripes, I know a lot of cards still have the magnetic stripes. If you can't tap it, you insert it. If you can't insert it, you swipe it. Magnetic stripes are still on everything, and they're probably the weakest of the three. Uh, so skimmers are still very much out there. Generally, I, whenever I walk up to an ATM that I haven't used before or somewhere I haven't been, I usually grab a hold of that outer section, give it a good pull. Because if it's an actual ATM, those things are bolted together like you wouldn't believe. But if it's just kind of stuck on there, because when they go and set these skimmers up, they don't exactly have all the time in the world. They're in there pretending to have a transaction and they just kind of stick it on. So they don't really have a lot of time to really secure it. Uh, if you saw somebody going into a bank branch with a glue gun, I'd be severely worried. <laughs> but always kind of keep an eye on things. And the same thing with the pin stealing at the bottom, because you'll see that that's actually a pin pad over the top. So if they can skim your card, they can probably duplicate it. And if they've got the pin, that's really all they need to do. Again, cards with chips and the tap to pay RFID, they're a lot harder to duplicate. But a lot of people still have those older cards. And you generally think of bank cards as having the latest greatest technology, but there's other cards that you might have, you know, uh, that have, still have a magnetic stripe on them that contains personal information. So that's one thing to be aware of. Uh, it, here's one that's interesting that's been around for a while, and this is actually a picture off of Amazon. So you could actually go to Amazon and actually buy this thing, and it's a USB charging block, whatever you want to call it, that you put into a PowerPoint, except it's actually got a camera in it. Yes, that might make sense if you're ultra paranoid and you want that extra layer of surveillance in your home to have hidden cameras everywhere. I don't know where you live, but you know, let's just say that you've got cleaners that come in once in a while or something like that, and you just, you just want to be certain, fine, there's a market for that. But in this case, you might find these randomly scattered around in an airport. Somebody might, oh, you know, I really need to plug my phone in, but I didn't bring my block with me. And then you see one of these things just randomly plugged into the wall. Oh, sweet. Plug it in. Meanwhile, it's sitting there recording you putting in your pin and all these other sort of things. So just be very wary. If you find one in the street randomly, just dispose of it. You know, uh, unless you're really, really adventurous and you want to take it apart and see how it works. Nine times out of ten, when you find one of these things left behind, it's just because somebody left it behind. It's not got a camera in it. Uh, I've probably only encountered two or three of these things in the wild, and that's from a lot of travel, but they are out there. And then the last one is about just basically randomly scanning something that's in your wallet. Again, cards with chips and the, you know, the tap to pay, very, very difficult to duplicate. What's more likely to happen is, you know, if you've got tap to pay set up, and it's like limited to 100 bucks or something like that, Let's just say that I have the ability with an iPhone, because you can get the, the iPhones that do this, or the Android phones that do this, or even just buy these little handheld FPOS machines. Then I could go through a crowded airport and just kind of surreptitiously walk up behind people's purses and back pockets and just kind of keep getting them a hundred bucks, hundred bucks, hundred bucks, hundred bucks. Just that contactless payment. So I do have something that's actually pretty cool that I'll show you after. But you can buy these wallets, uh, RFID wallets or whatever they call them, uh, that will prevent your card from being scanned. I'm not so worried about your card being duplicated as much as these surreptitious charges, rather. So, has anybody ever seen this before? I didn't think so. Uh, this is what's called the Scott E-Vest. Now, this looks ultra high-tech. This looks like something that Hugh would give James Bond, right? But all of these different pockets, all these different pockets have various purposes. They have the RFID scanning prevention put in it, so you can have your phone and all your other stuff with you, your wallet, and it can't scan anything because it basically blocks it. It acts like a portable Faraday cage, for lack of a better term. Some of these are pretty slick. And people say, well, I'm not going to wear something like that. It would make me look like the Michelin Man walking around. 
think twice. That's the kind of stuff that Scott E. Hess produces. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Go to the website and check them out sometime. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever. I just think it's really cool technology. Jackets, long jackets, dresses, but get this, dresses with pockets. That's right. And pockets that will prevent... Uh, English Logan, English. Pockets that will prevent your card from getting scanned. And all these other sort of things. And shorts, polos, like... They've even got hats, okay, which I thought was pretty cool. But then when I saw the face masks, so if you actually had to wear a COVID face mask, they've actually got them that you could actually surreptitiously hide a card in or something like that to prevent it from being scanned. I'm thinking, what state would you be in that you have to hide your card in your face mask? <laughs> You're following along, I know. You don't have to follow the bouncing ball. Okay, so if you're on the go or standing still, here's a question that comes up a lot about sinking to rental cars. Now, there used to be a time when you sink to a rental car, you know, it was just so you could listen to music, take a few phone calls. The advances in automotive technology, like your Teslas and that, these cars are getting really, really smart. So I'm very, very iffy on sinking my phone to a car that I don't own, rental cars particularly. I'm probably more likely to put my phone in a hands-free cradle, but not sync it to the phone. Uh, what's interesting is sometimes you'll get into a rental car. Uh, I haven't done this recently, but back before COVID, I was up in Cannes for, for a project, and I jumped into a car, and I went to sync my phone to it, and then it automatically offered to sync all the contacts that it had to my phone. So a previous business traveler had synced his phone to the car, and then it was offering to give me all of his business contacts. So what I do generally as a matter of, of, of habit now is whenever I get into a car, is I clear the cache. You know, you can go in through the settings and you can clear it. Uh, the other one is hotel Wi-Fi. My general rule for Wi-Fi, if it's anything outside of your home or your place of work, is use a VPN. You want to get connected. Hotels are getting a bit better because at one time you got, what, a gig a day or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm just saying use a VPN, and I gave you a list of them earlier. Uh, what about signing into smart TVs with your accounts? Let's just say that you're going to be staying someplace for a while. You want to watch your Netflix or your Stan or your Hulu or your Amazon or your Disney or God. There's so many of them these days. Let's just say you want to sign in with your Netflix account. Happy days, you're watching Netflix. And then you leave. How many people remember to disable that or to log out? Nobody. This is actually a really good way to get show recommendations. You go to the hotel, you turn on Netflix. There's their profile, there's everything they've been watching, there's their save list. Oh, I didn't think about watching that, that's brilliant. Uh, again, that's a situation where I generally will go in and I will remove the accounts. Uh, I don't have to be the one to watch what's going on. However, I didn't tell you this, what you do is you go in and if somebody's Netflix is there, go in and start watching a whole bunch of random stuff to mess with their algorithms. So when the suggested shows appears, it's like, my God, where did this come from? <laughs> And somebody else is going, what are you watching? Mm -hmm. It wasn't me. <laughs> but I'm evil. Uh, any USB port on a device is okay to charge, right? People figured, oh, well, I, oh, I don't have any power ports or something like that. But most televisions, clock radios and stuff like that, they have USB ports on them to plug in and charge. Is that safe? Nine times out of ten, yeah, it's perfectly safe. But again, you don't know if somebody's got malware in that television. A lot of places you're probably never going to run into that as a threat. But if you just see a random USB port and you don't know what's behind it, it's probably best to just avoid it. Look, if it's life or death and you absolutely have to charge your phone, do it, but keep an eye on it to see if there's any kind of funny behavior. But there's, or even just run out somewhere to the local uh, local chemist and buy you know, a charger. You can buy a, a generic one for next to nothing most places. Um, what about ATMs? I covered that previously. Um, but anytime that you're in an ATM, just make sure that you've got situational awareness. Uh, when I first did this presentation, cash was still very much a thing. Uh, as we know that since COVID came along, contactless payment, uh, places not taking cash. Now there's even discussions that the banks want to start charging you to use cash. Uh, a lot of places don't handle it. Um, so that bullet point is probably going to disappear before too, too long. But ATMs are always going to be around. Uh, so they're always going to be considered a bit of a threat to contact. So what about no contact payments, like tap to pay? How many people here use the tap to pay, either on your phone, your watch, your card? Yeah, most of us, you know, there's, there's a good number. So both are, the secure is each. So either contactless, like your phone, or the physical card itself, both are basically the same. 
And the reason I say that is because cloning cards is very, very difficult. It's more likely that you get hit by like what I call a portable FPOS scam. That's what I alluded to, where you can have the handheld device, whether it's your phone or it's an FPOS machine, and you go around and you scan people's purses and wallets and back pockets and stuff like that. Uh, that's what you're more likely going to run into. So mobile, so if you're using Apple Pay, for example, it creates a unique code every time. Every transaction creates a unique code. It doesn't actually relay the card information itself. It only relays that code. So if someone was to intercept that information, it's completely useless. If the transaction fails, the next transaction or attempt will be a separate one altogether. Is it foolproof? Absolutely not. Because I learned a long time ago, there's no such thing as impossible, only improbable. Because if anybody remembers watching Star Trek from the 60s, the original series, remember all the technology that was on that show that we thought was so futuristic? I mean, look, that, that was a, a little bit before my time, but I grew up loving Star Trek like everybody else. And now you look at the technology that's out there, it makes, yeah, we had that stuff 20 years ago. You know, that's just the evolution of things. So I always say improbable instead of impossible. And the tap to pay, so you got the RFID, which is radio frequency identifier. So that little chip that's inside your physical card is unique to you, to your bank account, for that particular thing. So if you lose your card, you get a new card that has a complete new chip, which is completely random again. And it sends that unique note to the NFC, which is near field communication. Now this brings up another point. Everybody calls it tap to pay. How many people, when they use the cards or the phone, you physically tap the device, you hit it? Most people do. You don't actually have to. That near field communication, you only have to hover it. Which is kind of funny. When you think about all of the lockdowns and restrictions that we went through through COVID, you know, there's no the physical uh, distancing, you know, the, the bulletproof glass between checkouts and Woolies, you know, when they thought that was going to work and you know, we're all in this together, that sort of stuff. And here we are, we're going around, we're dragging that phone, and that wallet with the cards in it everywhere. How many people will actually pull out like a sanitizing wipe and wipe your phone down? Not too, too many people. So you're traipsing all over the place during COVID, going out and buying essentials, including the bottle shop, yes, I recognize that, that you're tapping and you're touching and you're whacking it around the card, is wiping and that's going into your back pocket. Ugh. Okay, so what happens if you lose your device or get stolen? It happens. Anybody here ever have like a phone nicked while you're on vacation? You know, it, it happens. Uh, so what do you do about that? First thing you should do is notify the telco because they can work the phone. You don't have to know your IME number, so your IMI, IMI number, whatever it is, is unique to that device. You, you don't have to give that to them. You just say, hi, this is so-and-so, verify it, and they'll just work your phone and it becomes useless and nobody can do anything with it. Uh, same with that number. You might also want to let the insurance know, you know, it's a, if it's a fairly expensive device, because how friggin' expensive are iPhones getting these days? It's like a down payment on a house. Well, maybe not that bad. Maybe not that bad. Uh, and of course, notifying the authorities, depending on the situation, depending on what sensitive data is at stake. Uh, any financial institutions you do business with, did you have an app on that phone? ANZ, ComBank, any of those? This is just being proactive. This is just purely being proactive just to try to notify as many institutions as possible because our entire lives are on these phones these days. So just reach out and say, my phone's been stolen and it has access to my card. What they can do is put temporary freeze on your account and help you out. Uh, change your passwords because you never know if they manage to get into your phone and you've got stored passwords in there. For example, if you keep them in a notepad or something like that, or they could possibly even get into your password manager if you have a basic one that has just a basic password. Again, very, very difficult to compromise, but don't take chances. That's one thing I do want to emphasize with all this stuff, is just don't take chances. Be proactive and stay on the safe side of things. And if you have the ability to remotely lock and disable or wipe the device, like if you're using an iPhone, and you can get onto iTunes through a mate's phone, log in as yourself on his device, or on, on her iPad, or whatever you can get your hands onto, and wipe that device, do it. If you do get it back, now, that's either if you found it, like if you forgot it on a cafe, and then it mysteriously shows up on a lost and found, or it's been seized by the authorities for inspection at the airport, consider it compromised. So you don't know what's happened to that device when it's been inside of your possession. You don't know what's happened to it. They didn't just take it away, hold on to it, and then give it back to you. That is quite likely that they've gone through it. So I would consider the device compromised. Some authorities are just simply doing the job. Other places, I wouldn't be quite so sure exactly what's going on. 
And this isn't applying to everybody, but if, if you're a high-profile individual or something like that, they might have a lot more of a vested interest in you and what you have. Wipe and restore it, change the passwords. You know, it's probably not a bad idea to just get another phone if it's in particular situations. For the most part, just wipe it and restore it. It'll probably be okay. And then just keep an eye on things for suspicious activity. So that might be weird, weird pop-ups. All of a sudden, you're going to a whole lot of extra spam or scam messages might be starting to appear. Uh, weird things happening, say, to your bank accounts, attempted transactions. Just keep an eye on things. When you get back, you know, monitor the devices. Keep an eye on your accounts. Back it up. If, if you've gone away somewhere and then you've come back and everything's been hunky dory, just back it up just as a matter of due course. Uh, update your passwords. This is a good case for password vault. Normally, if I've been traveling for a long period of time and I don't know where I've logged in, where I've used my device, I will probably just update my passwords just in due course. And the other thing that if you learn anything while you're doing this sort of thing, share it with people. You know, throw it up in the Facebook groups and the travel groups, share it with your friends, anything like that. Because when people share this kind of information, they send stuff to me all the time, say, hey, you know, I was here, I saw this, I did this. That's really, really good, because then what happens is I can take that information, I can throw it up on these things, and I can share it with you guys. A lot of the content that's in my slides actually comes from people giving them to me. I've had conversations on ships, maybe I was out with the public and mates, they give me some information, then I can share it with you guys. So some of the key takeaways here is to remember before, you want to prepare to travel securely by securing your devices and having backups. So when you start planning your vacation, start planning to secure your devices and your accounts. It only takes a few minutes here and there, maybe to do a little bit of a cleanup, a little bit of a backup, but you know, book the cruise tickets and the transfers and the airport tickets and that sort of stuff, and then, okay, I'm taking my phone with me, uh, buy the internet package or uh, do what you need to do. But prepare and do your research. Obviously, go to Smart Traveler and look up where you're going and what are the potential threats. And while you're traveling, just avoid public Wi-Fi. I know it's not always practical, but if you can use a VPN, that's probably one of your safest bets. If you have to use public Wi-Fi, or you can get an eSIM. Like, for example, when we were in Singapore, I just bought an eSIM with five gigs on it, and I used it. That was fine. You know, I didn't have to worry about any roaming charges. Now, never mind the fact that I'm an Optus customer, <laughs> and Optus is owned by Singtel, which is based out of Singapore. It's like, you know what, I'm just not messing with it, because the last few times I've tried to use Optus roaming in Singapore, it's been a complete mess. So if you're, I'm just gonna go with something else. And while you're away, just be very mindful of where you are, where you sync your devices, where you sign in, if you sync to a rental car, if you've logged into a hotel with your Netflix account, any place that you might have used your device, just be aware of that so you can kind of clean up your digital footprint somewhat. Have a plan B. Uh, generally, whenever I come on a cruise, I always share contact details with somebody, said, yes, this is my contact details. But these are the contact details for the ship itself. If you can't get in touch with me and it's an emergency, contact the ship. They will come and find me. I'll probably be sitting in the Adventure Hotel, but they will find me. And maintain your situational awareness, especially when there's financial transactions involved. Now, whether you're paying a bill at a restaurant, or you're taking money out of an ATM, or maybe you forgot to pay a bill and you have to jump online to pay a bill, any time that you're doing any kind of a financial transaction, just take a few moments to kind of make sure that you're doing it cleanly, securely, and, and just keep an eye on things after the fact. And after, just monitor your devices and accounts. But the most important thing when you're on vacation is to enjoy yourself. I mean, I know it's really easy to get all swept up in the cybersecurity and scams and cyber crime type of thing, but if you do kind of go through the motions, preparing before you go away, and just being mindful while you're on vacation, then it becomes on autopilot after a period of time. So thanks, folks, for attending. Here is my contact details. If anybody wants to take a picture of the screen, uh, you can go to my YouTube channel. This presentation here will probably be up within, within the next day or so. Uh, you can contact me on LinkedIn. I mean, yes, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, even though I don't really put too much cyber stuff up there. Uh, and of course, you can always email me. That's my contact address. Uh, if you've got random questions after the cruise and you say, you know, I wish I would have asked that, <coughs> Please, just send me an email and I'll try to do what I can. I've still got people from previous cruises that I've worked on still reaching out to me and, you know, communicating back and forth. You know, what do you think about this? What have you heard? Can you help me with this sort of thing? So I'm more than happy to extend that to all of you as well. Uh, I'll probably take a few questions.